so today also we have a lot of participants as usual last time we had more than 200 at the beginning and today we have more than i think 140 uh, at the beginning so let me start the presentation we are going to discuss uh, about the surge protective device spds uh, the spds uh, internationally uh, the is uh, uh, the the iec uh, sectional or subcommittee 37a is uh, creating standards on low voltage surge protective device and you can see here uh, so there is a letter missing working group three and working group five these two are the groups those who are making standards on uh, low voltage uh, spds for power line we have been in the field of uh, surge protective device since 1997 I still remember one of my first industrial visit uh, to uh, in Tamil Nadu uh, to a place uh, near Trichy to a paper mill. This paper mill was having a problem. Uh, it was a variable frequency drive uh, and the drive was tripping unnecessarily. It was a large drive, probably about uh, 200 kilowatt or so. Uh, whenever there was a switching, capacitor switching on the high voltage side of the uh, the transformer or on the substation, this drive was tripping. And this drive tripping was creating a big problem to the industry because uh, the whole plant was, the whole process was shut down. Then uh, they have to clean the machinery. They have to restart the production. So it was a wastage of material plus a lot of uh, time waste. So then what happened is at that time, uh, industry doesn't know what is an SPD during, I'm talking during 97 or 98. So we installed our first SPD for an industry. Of course, before that, we were doing it for wind turbines, but uh, that was our first experience. And finally, we could solve the problem. The customer was so happy and nobody expected that uh, an SPD is so efficient in stopping the tripping of uh, a variable frequency drive. Now, coming back uh, uh, to the presentation, international standards. Surge protection has to be, is carried out based on two main standards. The first one on the left side is SPD standards. So there are uh, standards made by uh, SC37A, which is basically for the uh, low voltage, uh, that means up to 1000 volt AC and 1500 volt uh, DC application for power line, for data line, for signal line, and for solar PV, you can see the standards name 61643, 11, 11, or 21, 31, these are for uh, uh, requirements and test method, and uh, 12, 22, 32, these are the selection and application principles. So these are about the SPD standards, and uh, when you install an SPD in a uh, line, in an installation, you also should look into the standard IC6036 which talks about the selection and direction of electrical equipment, device for protection for safety, isolation, switching, control, and monitoring, especially SPD is also explained here. So when you select or when you install an SPD in a low voltage line, we also should take care of the requirement of these particular standards. So in these two seminars, part one and part two, we will discuss the various requirements from these standards. But of course, you know, uh, two seminars are not enough to create uh, the complete awareness, but we will try to make it as best as possible. Now, coming back to the concept, uh, it is nothing but equipotentialization, not only for electrical safety, uh, the concept for lightning protection system, the concept for SPD, everything is based on equipotential bonding or equipotentialization. So how best you make the equipotentialization is finally deciding whether your electrical installation is safe against touch voltages, safe against uh, lightning, safe against surges and so on. I will, to start with, I will explain with a small example and then try to analyze how the problem can be solved. What you are seeing in the picture, imagine in your house, you have an appliance, some electronic appliance, and this appliance is class one appliance. You have a line connected to it, you have a neutral connected to it, and you have a PE conductor, earth to air connected to it. First, we should understand, uh, I am just trying to explain the definitions of voltage, which is uh, related to transient over voltage protection. Because 
the protective devices like uh, all other protective devices such as ocpd rcds and uh, and other uh, device such as afdd these are operating on c in series it disconnect the current whereas spds are devices which are connected in parallel to the line so which is this is uh, uh, very important to understand so these are voltage operated devices so voltage and uh, voltage parameters are very important to or the first important point to find out uh, the performance of spd and its application so in the standard the first one is nominal voltage nominal voltage is nothing but uh, the normal voltage 230 volt for example under this condition your appliance is 100 percent safe maximum expected voltage you know very well that 230 plus 10 percentage or plus or minus 10 percentage we say generally generally so let us assume that plus 10 percentage this is the maximum voltage which can come into or between line to neutral and under this condition your appliance must be safe any voltage more than 253 let's say for example 260 270 280 300 these are actually not uh, the normal voltage or these are not the maximum continuous operate, operating voltage. These are voltages which can come intermittent for temporarily due to some uh, problem in the line for certain time, not for a longer time. So under this condition, probably your, your, your electronic appliance is able to withstand, uh, let's say, for example, 15 minutes. Higher voltage, 320, 350, 400, 440 volt, again higher voltage. Under this condition, still your equipment probably may withstand a few minutes. Example, one minute. Again, up to 1000 volt, 1200 volt. Your equipment may withstand up to 10 seconds. This is an example. Now, you may, we must also understand that these are line to neutral, but between line to earth, due to a high voltage fault, all equipment which we connect to a line must be able to withstand the 1200 volt plus nominal voltage means about 1450 volt between line and PE for five seconds. This is a standard requirement. Now, what I wanted to tell you is under normal condition, your equipment is safe. Under maximum continuous operating voltage, your equipment is safe. safe. Under temporary over voltages, your equipment may withstand a certain time depending upon the voltage. Now here, we have two solutions to protect the equipment. The first solution is probably the equipment is able to withstand that particular voltage. Instead of uh, you know 10 seconds for 1200 volt, let's say it can withstand 1200 volt continuously, probably a special device. So this is one technique which can be applied to protect uh, the appliance. The second technique which can be applied is you disconnect the supply. In case of any temporary over voltage, let's say for more than 200 milliseconds, you disconnect the supply. In order to protect the equipment, two techniques which can be applied is one is the equipment can withstand these high voltages. Number two, if the equipment cannot withstand, you disconnect the supply. Similarly, even a higher voltage, let's say in the range of kilovolts, 2 kV, 5 kV, 10,000, 10, 30,000. So once when the voltage is again more and more, you can see here, it may withstand 100 millisecond in one case. It may withstand 10 microsecond in one case. And it may withstand one microsecond in another case. So depending upon the transient voltage, these are transient voltages. The equipment may be able to withstand for a short time and in immediately after one microsecond, for example, it may fail. These are examples I'm explaining just to create a, a background how SPDs are working. The two uh, ideas which can be implemented to protect the equipment is first uh, equipment shall withstand equipment manufacturer decide that I make an equipment which is very, very strong against transient. So my equipment is able to withstand. I don't need anything extra. So this is one idea which can be implemented. And the second idea is uh, you limit the voltage less than its withstand voltage very important see in the previous case the time is more you have time to disconnect whereas in the second case transient over voltage you don't have enough time to disconnect because before the line is disconnected for disconnection you need some device to operate before the disconnection happens you were the the voltage the withstanding time is quite less so the technique to be applied is limit the voltage don't make it more than certain 
level. So, for example, instantaneous within a short time in nanoseconds, for example, uh, you limit the voltage. As a result, uh, once when you are limiting the voltage, your equipment is safe. So, these parameters you should always keep in mind. Now, equipment shall withstand is an important subject. Each equipment, how much voltage an equipment can withstand has been included uh, in the subject of IEC, insulation coordination. Insulation coordination, uh, I don't want to read it. Probably once when you uh, look at the video, you'll be able to understand. So insulation coordination is a subject which talks about uh, how the insulation between two life conductors or between life conductor and earth can be maintained in an equipment so that or in an installation so that maximum life can be expected. Now, there are several parameters which is influencing the insulation level of our equipment such as uh, uh, insulation coordination because of clearance, uh, temporary over voltage, impulse withstand voltage, steady state peak voltage, recurring peak voltage. There are, you know, pollution, degree of pollution, micro environment. So many uh, parameters are influencing the uh, uh, insulation uh, of the equipment. Uh, but uh, out of these parameters, uh, the one parameter which is important is impulse withstand voltage. So the rated impulse withstand voltage is considered as the base for insulation coordination. What is this impulse withstand voltage? <clears throat> you have here a sine wave and there is a transient over voltage, let us say, which is created due to a, a, a surge, maybe a lightning or some kind of switching action. Now, the standard wave shape, which is recommended in the standard for UW, voltage impulse withstanding capacity, is called as 1.2 to 50 microseconds. It means this voltage is generated in a laboratory in order to test the insulation level, short time insulation withstand of an equipment as a voltage waveform. And this voltage waveform looks like in 1.2 microseconds, it goes from zero to peak. Let us say the withstand voltage is 5 kV. So the voltage goes from zero to peak in 1.2 microseconds and it comes to half of the peak. Let's say five half is 2.5. So zero to 5 kV in 1.2 microseconds and back to 2.5 kV in 50 microseconds. And this is the standard wave shape which is used for voltage impulse test. So every equipment, the manufacturer should uh, test the equipment with this kind of an impulse voltage. And there are four categories of such devices or these the, the electrical appliance for a 230 or a 230, 400 volt or with a nominal voltage up to or maximum 300 volt. They are categorized into four categories, category one, two, three, four. Say for example, 230, 400 volt, you have the category one as 1,500, 2S, 2,500 or 2.5 kV, don't look at the comma, I think I, I made a mistake, it's uh, in Europe, uh, they may, they do, you know, they, they make a comma. So 1.5 kV, 2.5 kV, 4 kV and 6 kV. So basically, uh, the four type of voltage impulse withstanding categories are mentioned in the standard, four categories, where they are applied is very important. Category 4 is a device which has to be used at the origin of the installation. That means whenever you, whenever your electrical installation starts uh, at the mains incoming panel, all the electrical apparatus which you are using, such as the switch gear, such as the meter, such as the CTs, such as uh, the MCBs or whatever, all these devices are supposed to have, uh, uh, of course, MCB probably uh, in a large panel is not possible, but uh, uh, all these devices must be of uh, installation category four. Category three is equipment in fixed installation. I have some examples I will show you. Category three is energy consuming equipment and category one is an electronic apparatus. So these four categories are mentioned in the standard. Now, for transient over voltage protection or surge protection, the first parameter which uh, we are supposed to uh, I will switch off my video for a short time. The first parameter which we are supposed to identify or mention is the voltage impulse withstanding capacity. 
so here for example i am showing a catalog from uh, uh, schneider you can see here over voltage category as per ic 61010 this is category 4 that means this device is uh, you can use it at the mains incoming panel that is the meaning similarly another uh, mcb over voltage category 3 means at the mains incoming you cannot uh, use this mcb you have to use it at the sub switch board or at the fixed part of the installation another mcb s 750 abb over voltage category 4 that means uh, at the mains incoming panel board, you need to have this particular MCB, not the previous one. So here, S200, you cannot use it in, uh, uh, in the mains incoming because it is over voltage category 2. The second one, over voltage category 4, means 6 kV it can withstand minimum. So you can use it at the mains incoming panel. This is uh, uh, from... Uh, Kusum uh, uh, multimeter, you can see here uh, safety, double insulation, and you can see the category here, category 3, 1000 volt AC or DC, category 3, category 4, 600 volt AC and DC. What does this mean is, this meter can be used in location 3 up to an operating voltage 1000 volt AC. Similarly, this meter can be used in location 4, that means at the mains incoming, for testing the parameters of a panel board, provided the voltage is up to 600 volt. That means category 4000 volt is not allowed. So this is how it has to be read. Another classic example, for example, elevators. Why I am specifying this elevator is the last, you know, last few days, uh, the apartment which I am uh, uh, living has got a big problem of uh, uh, elevator uh, frequent failures and we were trying to investigate. But this, I included because this is probably a good information for you. So elevators are part of fixed installation. It's not a portable device or it's not a pluggable device. It's a fixed installation. You install it and it's permanently connected. So in the one moment, I will show you, yeah, here, these are the categories at the mains incoming, Category 4 device at the fixed installation. That means uh, the, your, your wiring is fixed. The, the sub switch board, the wiring, uh, the, the fixed installation such as uh, equipment like fan, equipment like uh, light fitting. These are not pluggable. These are fixed equipment. Then connected device uh, you can have, uh, you see here 2500 volt, 4 kV, 6 kV. These are the voltage impulses which is mentioned now lift is a part of a fixed installation the iso standard 8102 part 2 explains about the design rules calculation examination and test of lift component because it has got various components electrical mechanical electronics now in this uh, standard if you look uh, 5.15, it is talking about the, uh, the testing of electronic components and here 5.15 exclusions, the following devices are excluded from the testing. One of this is, for example, you can see here on the right side, the, the table and uh, uh, here this is actually applicable for auto couplers. Failure exclusion shall only be considered provided that components are applied with their uh, 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 worst case uh, characteristics, value, temperature, humidity, voltage, and vibration. Uh, uh, table 3 explains uh, conditions under which certain faults can be excluded. Uh, here, actually, optocouplers, you can see here, optocouplers are excluded from this testing. That means the entire electrical installation of the lift must be tested for category 3. One of the exemption or the only exception is optocouplers. So category three can withstand 4 kV here. Category three device, voltage impulse withstand of the lift electrical installation is 4 kV for a 230 or a 400 or 440 volt operating voltage or a three-phase lift. Now, the other requirement is the lift between line and the earth. Five seconds voltage withstand between line to PE is 1200 volt. This is also an additional requirement. Category 3 means minimum the lift should be able to withstand these voltages up to 4 kV transient over voltage and uh, 
temporary over voltage up to 5 seconds 1200 between line and p now the safety issue comes into picture all of you know that in most not most almost all high rise buildings the lift has got a separate earth electrode through the lift uh, through the shaft uh, separate earth uh, bus bars are running and it is connected to separate earth electrode and the network looks like a tt now in a tt network where the high voltage side and lv side the transformer uh, the power supply comes from a transformer the ht and lt side probably are separate or probably are interconnected now in the high voltage side if the ht and the lt are interconnected earth fault at the high voltage side create high potential please excuse about the spelling mistake create high potential at the lv side of the installation transfer potential resulting in failure or deterioration of the electrical system in lift so what does this mean is in a tt system you are getting power supply from a transformer and at the transformer if the high voltage side and the neutral of the transformer are interconnected under this condition in case of any fault on the high voltage side of the transformer whatever the voltage gradient which is created on the high voltage side will be transferred to the low voltage side which will be directly applied on that particular equipment as a result the equipment fails means a voltage of more than 1200 volt may appear between line and p as a result degradation of the equipment will happen and equipment may fail if we look at the 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 quality or the life of lift electronics in our buildings people those who are living in high-rise buildings they know it lift is always a, a headache one of the reason is this one because the the lift is of category three impulse voltage which stand is 4 kV uh, but we connect it like a TT and we don't have a, a, a control over the potential rise during a high voltage earth fault and we don't take care of it as a result lift may fail so these are the categorization for example now category one device uh, is uh, an appliance which is an electronic appliance which can uh, handle up to 1500 volt uh, transient over voltage but please note that these devices are not suitable for direct connection to a public lv supply if you are getting electricity or if you are using electricity from the electricity suppliers facility then of course class one or category one device we are not supposed to connect directly to the electricity supply now what is this impulse voltage there are four categories these categories you can see here category 4, category 3, 2, and 1, mains incoming panel, switches and industrial equipment, portable equipment, and uh, electronic equipment. If we look at uh, the electrical engineering standards, safety standards, uh, as I said, uh, the base uh, for everything is equipotential bonding. Now, at the mains, between the mains incoming and the switches uh, or the fixed part of the installation, with respect to lightning protection, the area the building is classified into LP Z lightning protection zone zero zone one zone sorry there is some uh, mistake uh, uh, Mr Dominic you are able to hear me yes sir thank you the, with respect to lightning protection, these are categorized into lightning protection zone 1, zone 2, zone uh, 3. Whereas uh, with respect to electrical uh, safety, we, it is classified, for example, between zone 0 Sorry. Main protective equipotential bonding, then uh, supplementary equipotential bonding, and so so uh, in this uh, typical fashion. So equipotential bonding shall be made uh, with respect to electrical safety, with respect to lightning protection, with respect to transient protection, and so on. Now, let us uh, look at our appliance. We have the appliance which is connected with uh, a line, neutral, and the earth wire. Then we have. Uh, uh, imagine our equipment, the appliance is having a, a withstand voltage, UW, that means the voltage impulse withstanding capacity is approximately 1.5 kV. Now, what do we do? 
we have to limit the potential difference to this equipment to a voltage lesser than its withstand voltage. That means between the line and neutral, the equipment, the appliance can withstand only up to 1.5 kV. If the voltage is more than that, of course, your equipment will fail. So what do we do? We have to limit the voltage which is going into the appliance to a limit less than 1.5 kV. Imagine at a typical condition due to some reason, probably due to a capacitor switching or some operation, a voltage of 5 kV, 5 kV is coming between line and neutral. Of course, our equipment will fail under this condition. What do we do? We have devices called as SPDs, which are connected in parallel to the line, between line to neutral, for example, between neutral to earth, for example, between line to earth, for example. In this particular case, I have shown three devices which are connected in parallel. And these devices are having a parameter called as voltage protection level or indirectly it is the voltage with which uh, the device is able to limit or higher voltages are limited to this particular level imagine we have three devices connected in this lines and these are able to limit the voltage more than 1.5 kV so once when the over voltage reaches this particular equipment, the devices are able to clamp the voltage to 1.5 kV. As a result, your appliance is safe, but due to this clamping, the current which is supposed to flow, it will flow through the SPD and it gets distributed throughout the line. Why the current is flowing? Because in order to limit the voltage to less than 1.5 kV, the impedance of this device is reduced to a lower level because you know uh, the the device is offering a low impedance for a short time or within a short time as a result the current is flowing through this particular device and we create a situation called as equipotential bonding so the current which is flowing through these devices, it can be either of 8 by 20 microseconds or 10 by 350 microseconds. In the last uh, seminar, we discussed about uh, the difference between 8 by 20 and 10 by 350 microseconds. Of course, the video in short uh, two to three minutes videos have been uploaded in our blog. You can have a look and find out what exactly 8 by 20 and 10 by 350 microseconds meant. So, Basically, this is how your appliance is protected. So you have an appliance. Most important, we should find out how much voltage this appliance is able to withstand. We are making an SPD connected between lines and the earth or between lines in some typical fashion. And these devices are having a parameter called as voltage protection level. The, these devices will limit the transient over voltage to that particular limit. As a result, your appliance is safe. This is what about SPDs. And what are the components? What is inside an SPD? SPDs are device uh, contains at least one nonlinear component, which is intended to limit surge voltage and divert surge current. For example, it has got uh, sometime MOVs or silicon avalanche diodes. Uh, MOVs internal, you can see here uh, the, the internal construction. It, it has got a metal oxide grains in ceramic. Anyway, our idea is not to educate what is an MOV and uh, our idea is to find out uh, how it works. So there is a voltage and V voltage and time characteristics. Imagine the transient is going to a very high level, the maximum limit I am not showing, probably the voltage is very high. These devices are offering a, volt, a, a very low impedance because it has got a nonlinear component inside. Suddenly it changes its characteristics. It offers a very low impedance. As a result, the voltage is limited. Voltage between the terminals are limited to a low level and this is called as clamping voltage and the devices which is doing this kind of a job is called as voltage clamping type device so a metal oxide varistor it is clamping the voltage it is not allowing the voltage to go beyond a certain level between its terminals and these are called as voltage clamping type device 
Similarly, there is another device which is called as a voltage switching device. Examples are spar gaps, GD tubes, horn gaps, and so on. These devices are operating in a different characteristics. Say, for example, you have the transient over voltage, which is, as I said, the maximum limit is unknown. These devices will work like a switch. Under normal condition, the switch is on, sorry, off, it is off. And whenever the potential difference is up to the voltage protection level or spark over voltage of that particular device, the switch is on. As a result, your line and neutral, for example, is short circuited. So these devices are called as voltage switching type device. It acts like a switch. Up to the up to its spark over voltage, it does nothing. And once when the voltage reaches the spark over voltage, the sudden the device will suddenly work like a switch, and it connect both the terminals. As a result, the uh, transient over voltage between the lines or wherever it is connected, it becomes almost near to zero. So there are two kind of devices with respect to characteristics uh, which is used as SPD. One is the voltage clamping type device, and the next one is voltage switching type device. Now what you are seeing in the picture is are the SPD components. So some of the SPD components probably you can see in the manufacturer's catalog. These are voltage limiting components. These are voltage switching components. The third one are a combination of a series of voltage switching and limiting component. Here the fourth one uh, parallel voltage switching and limiting component. So all these combinations are possible to with all these comp with all these you know different configurations spds can be made now both these devices voltage clamping type device and voltage switching type device how does it uh, operate imagine you have uh, the line neutral and p the line neutral and p we are using an MOV type uh, device, uh, metal oxide varistor type device. Uh, and how does this uh, device operate is very important or very uh, uh, interesting to understand. You have the voltage on the X in on the, uh, you can see here KV and you have the time, you have the transient over voltage, which is shown as the dotted line here. These devices are called as voltage clamping type device means uh, it is clamping the voltage to a level, let's say, for example, 1.5 kV. After the transient, that means at this end of the transient over voltage, uh, once when the impulse voltage reaches the nominal voltage, 230 volt, the MOV is out of circuit. That means there is a high voltage. This device is limiting the voltage to 1.5 kV. Once when the transient over voltage is lesser than 1.5 kV, and if it reaches 230 volt, this device is automatically out of the circuit. Nominal voltage is applied to the appliance, uh, so directly 230 volt goes to this particular equipment. The advantage of this device is it's fast and there is no follow current. We will see the follow current later on. The, this device is uh, temporary over voltages will lead to failure. So MOVs are having some advantage. It is having some disadvantage. The disadvantage is uh, the temporary over voltages such as uh, Imagine you have an MOV of 300 volt. If the voltage is more than 300, let's say 310 or 320 for some time, these MOVs may fail. Second is spar gap. Imagine in the same place, we have a spar gap. Please understand that the power supply is coming from a transformer. Probably you have a long line. The neutral also goes back. I have made a TMS kind of a system. You have a spar gap. The transient over voltage is something like this uh, on the dotted line. The device is acting like a switch. That means uh, once when the spark over voltage is reached, this device is acting like a switch. Your line and neutral is connected. It is like a short circuit. It is connected. After the transient here, once when the transient over voltage is over, once when the impulse voltage reaches the nominal voltage, this, the spar gap is still in short circuit condition, very dangerous. The spar gap will be in short circuit condition. As a result, what happens is the short circuit current of the network starts flowing through this particular device. And this device or this short circuit current 
which follows the lightning current or which follows the transient current is called as follow current. So short circuit current from the transformer will flow through the shorted spar gap. Then uh, if this current is flowing for a longer time, actually we are in trouble. If the, the, the follow current, if not stopped, will create further failure. The advantage of a spar gap is it can handle high energy, whereas the disadvantage is it is uh, slow. It is having a parameter called as follow current. It will also deteriorate after and every strike. This is also written in the standard uh, uh, spar gap. After every spark over, the some portion of the the the, the uh, metallic uh, electrolyte it melt and it changes the characteristics. These are documented in the standard. So each and every of these components has got its own advantage and it has uh, got its own disadvantage. So say for example, an MOV, the advantage is it is faster. Disadvantage is it will die of its own whenever there is a temporary over voltage. Advantage of a spar gap is it's high energy handling capacity. It can handle large current, but it is slow. It is having follow current and it is having deterioration uh, after each and every surge current. So each of these devices have its advantage and disadvantage. Now you are seeing an MOV. If you look at the symbol of an MOV, you will see in this fashion an MOV in a box. What does it mean is uh, inside the box, there are some protective device one and two. Not only an MOV, there are some protective devices integrated into it. Then only this combination can be called as a SPD. SPD is not just MOV. SPD is MOV plus its protective device. Number one, thermal fusing element and uh, uh, the monitoring of the thermal fuse. That is what is uh, written in one and two. What is thermal uh, fuse? Thermal fuses, uh, uh, SPDs, uh, MOVs always fail in short circuit mode in the sense at the end of life of this device, it creates a short circuit. Now, thermal fuse is to disconnect the MOV once when the temperature is higher than 80 degrees centigrade. There is a thermal fuse, which is actually a silver soldering and a spring mechanism. Almost all manufacturers follow the same system, bring a spring mechanism. Under this uh, spring mechanism, once when the temperature of this combination is more than 80 degrees, the silver melt or the, the soldering element melt and the spring remove the MOV from the circuit. So temperature higher than 80 degrees is due to any temporary over voltage uh, above UC or due to AG. So basically, uh, a MOV based SPD means it has got an MOV plus it has got a, some safety features integrated inside. It has got a thermal fusing element and nowadays uh, the MOVs, uh, the, the SPD also have got a HRC fuse inside. Now, once when it comes to the market, this particular part, the silver soldering and the spring mechanism is the very critical part of an MOV based SPD. That means, the efficiency of this protective device or this protective mechanism desired predominantly the cost of that particular SPD. In the market, you will get a lot of SPDs nowadays made in China, but somebody buys it, put a brand name and sell it in India at a very cheap price, especially these cheap SPDs are sold for solar PV. Be careful, the protective mechanism inside may not be efficient. It may lead to short circuit and it may lead to failure of your or fire in your buildings. So here is the symbol on the left side, the MOV based SPD, uh, spar gap uh, based SPD and spar gap and the MOV in series. So this is silicon avalanche diode uh, SPD and the spar gap SPD. These are the typical examples. These are called as uh, single port SPD. Single port SPD has, means it has got two terminals. One is for one line and the next one is for the other line. Whereas another category of SPD is called as two port SPD. That means there is in a two port SPD, it has got an input and output terminal. So there is an input and there is an output terminal either in this fashion or in this second fashion. So these are called as two port SPDs. Coming to spar gap, how it looks like? One of the simplest uh, form of spar gap is a two metal electrode and an air or 
air in between spark gap spark over is going to happen between the electrodes or between the metallic conductors in air one of the oldest construction of spar gap was something like this and these spar gaps uh, you can see here the construction and there are some holes provided on the spar gap and what this uh, spar gap or how the spar gap operates something like this the spark which is created inside the gap will blow out as a flash for example during a current flow the spark gap blows hot ionized gases through the holes provided in the arrester actually these arresters are discontinued several years back or several decades back for example but uh, why i am showing this is these devices are still sold in india because the oems in india they don't look at the safety parameter of the component they always look at the 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 uh, price part of the device as a result uh, these devices are still sold in india you can see some manufacturers those who have discontinued such product in their european market but still selling in india be very careful don't use an exhausting type spar gap it's a very old technology and if you are connecting this kind of a device in your panel board you have to be very careful you have to keep these devices away from your conductive parts such as bus bars and in 2000 during 2000 sealed spar gaps came into picture in the market called as encapsulated spar gap that means the blowout is not coming out of the device due to various technologies the 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 arc which is created is uh, uh, you know encapsulated inside the device uh, one of the initial technology which has come is called as graphite multi disc technology that means there are several uh, graphite uh, electrodes in series or parallel connected inside so these uh, devices actually it has got a funny principle or it has got a funny uh, parameter this graphite electrode has got a graphite powder inside so if you shake the device uh, with your hand probably the carbon powder inside the spar gap it accumulates in one portion of the spar gap if it accumulates in one portion of the spar gap and now if you test the spar gap with this kind of a spar gap you know a protective uh, a tester spd tester if you test the spar gap what happens is the parameter the voltage protection level keep on changing if you shake the spd on the right side uh, probably the voltage protection level is 1 kv if you shake it on the left side probably the voltage is 2 kv so it keep on changing such devices are also sold in the market so please be very careful so we were always uh, you know trying to write that uh, these kind of uh, spar gaps if you are using don't shake uh, the spar gap because if you shake it its parameter will change because of the carbon powder the conventional uh, conventionally there are uh, uh, the devices are classified into spar gaps or gd tubes voltage switching type device uh, metal oxide variester and tvss if you look at uh, a small comparison between these uh, three devices uh, you can see uh, the advantage of spar gap is high energy handling capacity it can handle 10 by 350 microseconds and its problem is voltage clamping high voltage clamp and follow current mov high current capability low clamping voltage but uh, significant overheating during conduction and uh, the uh, tvs like uh, the silicon avalanche diodes uh, these are lowest clamping voltage and uh, very low uh, energy absorbing capacity these three are the components which is used in an mov you are seeing one of the construction of a spd say for example a single thermally protected mov means uh, an mov and here there is a, a, the spring arrangement which i have told this is one of the uh, method the second method is a parallel movs a lot of movs in parallel series combination silicon avalanche diodes in parallel series combination so spds are made with so many techniques how does it operate is more important for us imagine we have uh, the main distribution board three phase incoming neutral incoming and then you have the pe conductor so basically on the left side you have the incoming and on the right side you have uh, the installation imagine i have four spds connected in this combination which we call as three plus one three plus one means three spds between 
three line conductors to neutral and one SPD between neutral and the earth. In this combination, imagine there is a lightning strike. Lightning strike is creating a high potential on the earth, for example. So the earth potential is going up. How does this device operate? Imagine I have four spar gap based SPD with a voltage protection level of 1.5 kV. It means once when the potential difference between the PE terminal and the neutral terminal is more than 1.5 kV, this device act like a switch. Now imagine the voltage is more and this device had acted like a switch. As a result, your earth and the neutral are shorted. Actually, it is not 100% shorter, but you just imagine that it is shorted. As a result, what happens? Potential difference between PE and neutral for the time being has become zero. But the same high potential of the earth is now applicable. It is transferred to the neutral. Suddenly, between the neutral and the other phases, the same potential difference is applied or it is applicable. As a result, these three devices also will switch on and it connect neutral and the other phases. So now we have created a situation which is a perfect equipotential bonding. Means the earth is connected to neutral, neutral is connected to the other three phases. So basically everything interconnected. As a result, there is no potential difference exist. Even if there is a potential difference exist, the potential difference is lesser than the voltage impulse withstanding capacity of the connected load. So this is how an SPD works. And you must understand that this kind of equipotential bonding is happening in a few nanoseconds or in few microseconds. It's very, very fast. So there is no device which can detect the transient and the switch off your appliance. The only opportunity or the only chance is to have this kind of a device. Now, how this device uh, works during a lightning strike in your building? You have a building. You have a power line coming from a transformer. The star point of the transformer is connected to earth. And here this green line means uh, under normal condition, everything is at uh, reference due to the earth potential. You have a very safe system. Imagine there is a lightning strike. The lightning current flows through the down conductor. It flows to the earth. As a result, what happens is some portion of the building will have a high potential. Some portion of the building will have a different potential. It depends on various parameters. So between the within the building, there is a potential difference created. And what you should do is to create an equipotential bonding in your building. If you created an equipotential bonding in your building, there is no potential difference between different metallic parts of the building. As a result, uh, the building is safe. But look at the power line, which is coming from the transformer. The power line is carrying 230 volt. Maybe due to lightning, the potential of your building is, uh, let's say, 50 kV. It can be even higher. So potential of every metallic object in your building is 50 kV. And uh, the line is only 230 volt. So there is a transient over voltage between the earth and the connected line. So what do we do? We connect the SPDs at the main incoming panel. You make an SPD here. This one, this is an SPD and the SPD is creating equipotential bonding between the earthing and the connected line. As a result, the line which is circulating inside our building is having the same potential of the earth. So a perfect equipotential bonding is created. As a result, all the equipment in our inside our building are now safe. Now, once when you make a equipotential bonding with an SPD, the most important parameter we should understand is called as UW, voltage impulse withstanding capacity of your equipment or of your connected load. Now, for example, I have used one type of connection. Here in the previous connection, I have shown three devices between line to neutral and one device between neutral and earth. In this case, I am connecting three devices between line to earth. The fourth device is between neutral and earth. So this kind of connection is called as four plus zero. To understand it better, we can call as three plus one connection and four plus zero connection. Both are a little bit different. Now, 
Lightning is always a common mode phenomena. For a common mode phenomena, this kind of a connection is much more efficient. The four plus zero connection is much more efficient than a three plus one connection. But then depending upon your network, like the, are you are using TT or TN where the uh, earth fault protection is uh, implemented. So based on several questions, we should decide the type of connection which has to be implemented in a typical building. Now imagine, your building has got a lightning, perfect equipotential bonding. There is an SPD at the incoming equipotential bonding between the earth and the incoming line. Everything is safe. The ISIC 62305 part four says, out of the 100 percentage current coming from the lightning, approximately 50 percentage goes to earth through the earth termination system. And the 50 percentage of the current is diverted through the connected metallic services. Metallic services are, for example, metal water pipe, metal gas pipe, electricity supply, three phase and the neutral or the PE conductor. Then you have a telephone line or so on. So 50 percentage of the current is diverted to the power line or to the connected services provided there is a long connected service line long connected the length let's say for example if the line is 200 meter 300 meter then large amount of current flows through this particular line but imagine a situation where the transformer is very close to your equipment very close to your building under that condition 50 percentage current may not flow through the lv connected service because there we have to make a separate calculation we will talk about it probably in the part two of the particular our our seminar so spd categorization the spd which is connected at the mains incoming switchboard or mains incoming panel they are called as uh, type one spd i have put surname because we have the habit of uh, the, the in uh, German standard, the old standard uh, SPDs were called as class B, class C, class D, very old standard. Uh, since uh, the, uh, since we have the habit of uh, uh, having, you know, calling these devices still in the old name, I just put as a surname, but this is actually an invalid name. You should call us type one, type two, type three SPD. Uh, type 1 is an SPD which is tested with uh, an impulse current of 10 by 350 microseconds. Type 2 is an SPD tested with an 8 by 20 microseconds. Type 3 is tested with uh, a voltage impulse of 1.2 to 50 microseconds. These are the first two are current impulse and the third one is the voltage impulse. We have explained about 10 by 350 and 8 by 20 in the previous seminar. I don't want to explain it again. Now, Type 1 SPD, how it is tested, 10 by 350 microseconds current. Imagine you have a 10 kilo ampere SPD, type 1 SPD, 10 by 350. In, that means the SPD is tested for 25 percentage of its rated current, means 2.5 kV, 50 percentage of its rated current, 5 kV, sorry, 5, 2.5 K, 50 percentage, 5 K, 75 percentage, 7.5 kV, K, and 100 percentage 10 ka positive and negative impulses are applied to the device and the device must be able to withstand these devices are suitable for lightning protection zone 0 to 1 between zone 0 and 1 these devices must be installed in the main switchboard second type of spd is type 2 spd which is tested for 8 by 20 microseconds these here the devices are tested for nominal discharge current 20 times maximum discharge current one time the application is between lightning protection zone one to two sub switchboard type three devices are closer to your equipment we will see more into this type one type two type three in the next part of uh, the uh, seminar part two of the seminar but uh, what you should understand is these type one spds are also tested for a type two parameter so generally the manufacturers call this as type 1 plus 2 SPD. By seeing, looking at type 1 plus 2 SPD, don't be uh, more interested. It is a type 1 SPD, but tested for type 2 parameters as well. More than type 1, type 2, you must check how much current it can handle. For example, type 1 SPD 100 kilo ampere, type 1 SPD 50 kilo ampere, type 2 SPD 12 kilo ampere. So we should 
uh, sorry, it's not type two, type one. Uh, there is some small mistake in my presentation. So like this, you should always check the current parameters as well. I am trying to show three, four type of SPDs, which is uh, uh, used or which we sell in the market. The for example, the first one is uh, called as uh, the name is the trade name is Strikesorb. It's a bus bar mounted SPD, which is having a lot of advantage, which I will show in the next uh, slides. For example, one of the models Strikesorb 80 OCPD means uh, the SPD. When you connect it to a line, it requires a backup protection and the backup protection, it can be up to 1600 amps ACB, for example. The short circuit current is 80 kilo ampere. The nominal discharge current is uh, uh, here. Follow current IFI is not applicable. That is, the, you know, I have, I'm just showing some of the parameters of this particular device. The second device is called as a phase gas discharge tube. The model number is this one, Protect T1S. Here, the OCPD, overcurrent protective device is 500 amps GG, means HRC fuse. Short circuit current rating is 100 kilo ampere. Follow current interrupting is 100 kilo ampere. Parameters of the second device. The third device is called as a multi-gap tube technology. In this case, there is a, with inbuilt backup protection, there is an additional fuse integrated inside the device. Model number is protective on SF, for example. Here, the OCPD not required. The backup protection is not required. Short circuit current rating is 75 kilo ampere. Follow current rating is 75 kilo ampere. Another device, Protect T1HS. Here, the device requires a 315 amps backup fuse. It's short circuit with standing capacity. 50 kilo ampere follow current is not applicable. So why I am showing these parameters are, all these SPDs are type 1 SPD. But it is also tested for a type 2 parameter, so we can call it as type 1 plus 2 SPD. But basically, the main categorization is type 1 SPD. All these are tested for a 25 kilo ampere impulse current. The current parameters we will discuss in the next upcoming seminar. So all these SPDs are tested for 25 kilo ampere. What I wanted to show you is. The safety parameters, because all our seminars, we are more talking about the safety more than uh, other parameters. So for safety, this device have got a backup protection, which is uh, 1,600 amps. Second device having a backup protection, 500 amps. The third device do not require any backup protection. The fourth device require up to 315 amps. So based on the device, so many type of uh, SPDs are available in the market, type one SPD, when you buy or when you select an SPD, you must understand your application and you must select the SPD appropriately. That is what I wanted to explain. Same performance, same impulse current, but different parameters are available. Now, for example, strikes all. This is actually a very special SPD, which is uh, having a large, uh, uh, you can see here, a large thermal capacity electrode to absorb the heat. It has got a, a metal oxide, a single distribution class metal oxide variester, and the construction looks like something like this. The SPD can be mounted on the bus bar. The advantage of this SPD is, next seminar, we will see the disadvantage with the connecting wire length. The advantage of strikes orb is, since we are eliminating the connecting wire, the performance, the ultimate protection level of this SPD is much better than a DIN rail mounted SPD. Say, for example, in a DIN rail mounted SPD with a connecting wire of, let's say, 250 millimeter square, the here you can see the surge current on the x-axis and you can see the let through voltage. So depending upon the surge current, the actual, the effective voltage goes into your equipment is higher and higher. Say, for example, for a surge of 30 kilo ampere, up to 12 kV voltage goes into your equipment. That means your equipment is ultimately not protected. It is because of the wire length, because a DIN rail SPD to connect, you need a little bit of wire and a HRC fuse. Whereas in comparison, the bus bar mounted SPD here, it is connected directly on the bus bar. As a result, the protection level is absolutely less. You get very good protection. The number two, these SPDs are high energy SPDs. Sometimes people say only spar gaps can handle high energy. MOVs cannot handle high energy, which is wrong. 
these devices say for example strikes or 80 if it is class 1 spd 25 kilo ampere class 2 up to 200 kilo ampere it can withstand these devices are also used for multiple strikes let's say 100 kilo ampere 65 100 times 65 kilo ampere 2000 times 10 kilo ampere 250 times uh, the the uh, the long duration strike uh, something like that so the SPD strikes orb, it's a very special SPD, which is having a response time of less than one nanosecond, very expensive, but for very specific and very big application. In comparison, the other SPDs are, you need a, a backup protection sometime. The modern ones doesn't need a backup protection. It has, it, it require a wire to connect and so on. We will look into these parameters in the uh, next slide. So basically, the devices, different type of devices, uh, uh, partial, the first one, it can handle uh, 10 by 350, 8 by 20, and so on. Let me skip these slides. This I already explained. But the most important uh, parameter or the most important point which I wanted to tell you is uh, when you are using an SPD, the safety of SPD is very important. I'm showing you a video where it is in a petrol pump. Technician is checking the power panel. You see what happened? So basically, they are checking the panel board and uh, suddenly there is an explosion. This explosion is because of an SPD. Now let me shut off the volume. Okay, now this explosion, what has happened is, the previous day, neutral of the power supply has been disconnected and some of the protective device uh, disconnected and there was no supply. And this gentleman, Without understanding that uh, there is no neutral, he switched on the incoming panel board or he's asking someone to switch on the incoming panel board and the SPD exploded. So SPD is a good device. It can protect your electronics, but if you don't select it and install it properly, this device can also be deadly. So please be very careful when you select uh, the SPD. By this, I would like to stop today's presentation. Probably we can go for a question answer session and the other parts of the selection we will discuss in the second part of our webinar, which is I think on the in two weeks. So with this, let me stop the presentation. Over to you, Mr. Dominic.